Alright, so I'm acknowledging as of late that while I've posted a video on the design process of Locking Mechanum, I haven't really explained much exactly about how it works. So in this short video, I'm probably just going to go over the generics of how it works and how I accomplished the Locking Mechanum mechanism and how other FTC teams might be able to eventually do the same. So I'll talk about this a little bit for anyone that hasn't interacted with me or other Lock and Mechanum designers before or hasn't seen a video on it before. Lock and Mechanum is taking a Mechanum wheel and looking at its biggest flaw in defense, which is saying you can push a Mechanum wheel directly to the side pretty easily compared to a full-on traction wheel. And this is very evident when bots are playing defense on each other on the field. So Locking Mechanum is saying that we're going to use some sort of actuation and we're going to break all of the rollers in place. We're going to make them stationary. We're going to turn the Mechanum wheel into a traction wheel and we're going to get all the benefits from that. And some of the benefits include about a 1.4 times traction increase and a 1.2 acceleration increase we're hoping to measure that at some point in the future, but we're not sure exactly what the numbers are. We just know they're around there. And then you're also going to have a much greater resistance to being pushed to the side or diagonally because it's a traction wheel. I could also talk about the history for a very long time, but as far as we can tell, the origin is WPI FRC in around 2010. They designed the first one. It was a pneumatic brake pad that moved linearly. Orange Crush FRC also created one that was a very similar design in 2017. Both WPI and Orange Crush did these in like 8 inch wheels. It's a little bit easier, ironically, to do Lock and Mechanum in FRC because of space constraints. Uh, granted, you do want it to be a lot more strong and you want it to be a lot more consistent for FRC, but space constraints alone make it a lot tougher in FTC. Um, 8581 designed one for Valor CAD Challenge in around 2020 and never got built. And then uh, myself with 16461, we built a novel design in 2021 pulling from all of these three previous designs, and we won Worlds Innovate with it in Fright Frenzy. It was a very, very long design process. It was around six months, but we think that now that we've gotten past that initial design process and that initial idea set with design uh, design goals, it's going to be a lot easier for other teams to eventually actually implement this stuff. So FTC 1002 actually exemplified this. They built a design very similar to ours in 2022. They placed for Division Innovate at Worlds within in Power Play and got a lot of benefits from it in general. I actually remember refing a match at Alabama where they tipped themselves over by using locking mechanism because of the increase in acceleration. It really can do a lot for things like acceleration, but 1002 designed one. They had a great time with it. It did take a couple months of work, but it was a lot easier based off of this precedent that I'm going to talk about in this video. Okay, let's talk actual design now. So there's a few big things that you have to think about when you're designing a locking mechanism. First of all, the wheel has to spin freely. Do not put anything that will cause direct friction that is not supported by a bearing or a bush in, inside of a locking mechanism. The wheel needs to be able to spin around whatever your actuation mechanism is, and if it's not able to, you will have parts melt, you will have parts heat up, you will have parts degrade over time, it's not a good idea. It has to be simple to actuate. So generally, a pushing and pulling motion is what's best for locking mechanisms. Pushing an axle into the wheel and pulling it out to actuate the braking motion. And it has to consistently break all 10 or 9 or 8 rollers, whatever mechanism you're using. It has to be able to break all of them. Because if you have some sort of unevenness, it won't have all of the same benefits. The Big thing for design that you need to think about is the friction force between the brake and the roller must be greater than the friction force between the roller and the ground. And if you've taken physics 1 or mechanics, this is probably going to be pretty easy for you to look at. Alright, I'm going to say pretty much wholeheartedly, if you want to design an easy locking mechanism, this is the best way to do it on an FTC scale. This five-way linkage that presses out individual arms that each lock two rollers, this is the best actuation mechanism to do it. So how we'll do it is we'll have a linkage set up like this. We'll have a set of bearings in the middle for whatever your actuation mechanism pushes back and forth. And this spread will effectively 
push out into the rollers and you can easily retract to the locking and it's just a really convenient method with a pretty low part count there's not much better you can do this is the product of like six months of discussion if you have a better idea than this please let me know i love to see other ways that one can do locking mechanism but this linkage mechanism is really a very easy way to accomplish the goal of locking mechanisms so it's what i would recommend if you're going to design one of your own now however i know there are some teams working on other mechanisms using springs and gravity and all of these other weird mechanisms where like, sometimes they're even only trying to lock the rollers that are in contact with the ground and none of the upper ones. There's a lot of weird things you can do to actuate this. If you want a simple one, I recommend the five-way linkage. But who knows? In three months, there may be some breakthroughs where people find some really cool ways to actuate it. So, actuation is just what's inside the wheel. And... The setup to push in and out your actuation mechanism is pretty simple, so I'm not going to go over that. But the big thing that I really need to go over for a lot of people is how to actually break the rollers. This is one of the biggest questions we normally get. Friction is tough on this scale, and to turn a servo into enough force to actually freeze all the rollers in place is really tough. We tried very, very extensively using silicon pads and foam pads and all of these typically considered frictiony materials. None of them worked. Do not try them. I do not recommend them. They are not worth your time. If you have a durable enough mechanum wheel, which pretty much every FTC mechanum wheel that's common on the market nowadays is going to be able to take this type of force, you should be using some sort of small set of spurs to dig into the roller. The analogy that I've always used when I'm describing it and judging is if you put like a rubber pad on top of a pillow and you try to pull out the pillow from underneath the rubber pad with a lot of force, the pillow's probably still going to come out. It's going to be tough, but the rubber's friction against the pillow isn't going to do much for actually keeping the pillow still. If you press a singular finger or something down into the center of the, the pillow and you dig that in so there's deformation around whatever you're pressing in and the pillow is like molding to fit that, then there's material on each side of whatever you're pressing in and you can't pull the pillow out very easily and it requires a lot less force. So that's basically what we're doing here. It's a weird way to describe it, but what we're doing here is we're taking these tiny little brass spurs on what we used were heat set inserts. I know some people have used like M5 set screws. I know there's been other uh, things like that, but if you're using silicon rollers, then you can use sideways heat set inserts or set screws and you can dig them into the silicon. And when you dig them into the silicon, that will make it so that they freeze in place and the rollers are a lot harder to move. It will leave some scuff marks on mechanum wheels. It is not damaging, I think is the big thing to highlight. We have had a locking mechanum running on this setup for two years. Not a single internal part has broken, not a single internal part has degraded enough to be unusable. It works. I would recommend it. This friction force is great go for it. Okay, and finally, general design. I'm going to post in this video description the CAD link for V7, which is the version that we've had working for two years and that won Worlds Innovate. I am on V10. I'm a college student. I'm very busy. I'm probably not going to have a public release version in any time soon, but V7 CAD is available, and there's a lot of people on various online platforms that have done Elmec and can help you out. This is a complex design. Do not be under any illusion that this is something you can do. I would rate it at near the same difficulty as making a Swerve module. It is difficult. Don't be disillusioned. But it will pay off a lot, and it will hopefully be as simple as you can make it after you're done with it. Elmec is a great way to have holonomic motion and traction motion. And if you follow our recommendations about actuation with the linkages 
and you follow our recommendations about freezing rollers in place, it should be possible for you to create a locking mechanism. Reference the CAD, contact me if you have any questions or want any advice, and have fun designing. I hope that everyone learned from whatever I put in here about all of my learned lessons from working on it. I know it's been about a year, two years actually, since I've even touched this design, but it is still something that I can help out with, and I'm available anytime I want to see this mechanism used more in FTC. I think it can do a lot for teams, especially in terms of defense. So that's it. Um, if there's any big holes in this explanation video that need another explanation video, I'll be glad to make it as well.